Right. Any other questions? Well, if you have questions as I go, as we go along, uh, just ask. All right. So there was a long break, so I'll do a longer review of what was going on. But it was luckily we were sort of we were just switch gears and we started talking about standard model. So this review is helpful because standard model is very very important. It's the most important theory around this. Um, so we're talking about standard model particle physics as a theory. Very, very successful quantum field theory that's fully well defined, meaning they're sure normalizable. Um, that unifies three of the four forces we see in nature: weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, and electromagnetism. Um, do you guys know what weak nuclear force is? Can you give me an example of a process? What's the evidence for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what gravity is, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Not a building gauge theory coupled to matter is the model that we picked. It's a gauge theory, and the gauge group is SU3C, C for color, SU2L, L for left handed, U1Y, Y for hypercharge. The matter is uh, fermions, two component fermions. We said for convenience, we're going to use Majorana notation, we could have used while notation but two component fermions. Do you know why two component? Well, I haven't explained this yet because you want to couple left and right separately. You want to treat them separately, right? Because of this L. And complex scalar field, which is Higgs. So we quickly reviewed last time spinners in three plus one dimensions. A Dirac spinner is four component spinner. So like this four component space time component, right? That transforms under Lorentz transformations in this following way, where these are the generators of the Lorentz transformations. Sigma Ks are Pauli matrices. In the chiral basis, you could just simply, uh, yeah, in the chiral basis, you can write these guys as, uh, uh, block diagonal uh, matrices in terms of uh, Pauli matrices, right? Because the action of the Poincaré generators is uh, block diagonal, it means that the representation is reducible. But if you recall, when we define different, when we define what a particle is, right? In QFT one, we said it's an irrep of uh, Poincaré, Poincaré group. Here, this is a direct sum of two irreps. Tells you that the Dirac spinner should be interpreted as two separate particles, each of them corresponding to one of these blocks. That's why we consider psi as two two component spinners. You could describe them as two while spinners or two Majorana. I said that Majorana is my favorite choice. We're going to stick to Majorana. What was special about Marana? Give me a one line definition of Marana for me. Huh? Exactly, say it louder. It's its own anti particle. Yeah. Good. So it's all about the CPT symmetry, right? All right, two component fermions. We had the wild spinners and Marana fermions, uh, Marana spinners. We define this gamma five. Well, this gamma five is clearly built to give you the projections to the upper and lower in these representations, right? And when you project the uh, Dirac spinner to the uh, left or right movers, it gives you the two top components, two lower components in this basis, Carl, uh, basis. Now, if you have some psi L, which is left hand left handed particle, right? It's antiparticle, epsilon psi L star, is going to be a right handed then. Right? So you could package them together as a vector with two degrees of freedom, four components, such that the particle is its own antiparticle in this way. Now you're going to have the left handed Majorana fermion and the right handed Majorana fermion, where the two degrees of freedom are here and here, and just fill up the 
other component as just such that is its own antiparticle. Epsilon is just I sigma T. I said everything here. Any questions about fermions in two plus one? The gauge sector of sound and molecular particle physics. Oh, I'm recording. Yeah, I'm re recording. Yeah. Gauge particle, uh, gauge sector of sound and molecular particle physics is a renormalized, sorry, it's a renormalizable interacting for the quantum field theory. The gauge group is, as I said, SU3 times SU2 left times U1L. The gauge field, the gauge boson for the hypercharge, we are going to denote it by B mu. The gauge bosons for SU2 left is the W mu A, there are three of them. Why? Because the SU2 generators of SU2 in the adjoint representations, these are, okay. there are three of them. And G mu alpha, there are eight of these guys. These are called gluons, the gauge bosons, corresponding to, uh, their spin one particle corresponding to SUC, SU3C color. All right, L means that this gauge group couples only to left-handed uh, particles, right? Um, fermions and, and something else. Left-handed fermions and Higgs, because we're gonna break that symmetry, that stupid symmetry, which is not a symmetry, it's a, it's a redundancy. And why is a hypercharge? Because it's not electric charge. <laughs> there are three generations of fermions, particles, fermion, right? The particles, we, we're going to class particles in two different groups, leptons and hadrons. Leptons are the ones that do not interact through strong force. They do not have color, right? So no color charge. Under SU3, they transform as trivial representation, and hadrons are this other stuff. Everything that talks to the nuclear uh, uh, through the strong force. Actually, the term hadron, I'm colloquially using it here. I will give you a cleaner definition in a bit. So here, the word hadron, I'm loosely using it, okay? The leptons of standard model, there are six of, <clears throat> six of these guys, electron, muon, tau, and neutrino electron, neutrino muon, neutrino tau. Why do I, why have I ordered them in like two groups of three? So the threes are the generations, but why do I split them into two groups of three? Because these pairs transform nicely under as you, they're the transforming the double part of a left hand, a part of these guys transform as a doublet. Well, these guys are only left hand, right? The left, the left hand, these guys are left handed, left handed parts of these guys and these guys sit together in a doublet for SU2 left. The right handed part of these guys are what in what representation of SU3? Singlet, what in SU2? Singlet because it's SU two left, right? So they, the right and the guys that parts of these guys can only have hypercharge. All right. So hadrons, there are tons of them because strong interaction is strong, right? Um, and but they're generated at deep in the at very very high energy, it becomes weak, weakly coupled. So we could talk about constituent particles, and there are six quarks that generate everything, organized in three generations. Right again, up charm tau, sorry, up charm top, down strange bottom. I've organized them in this way up and um and dm. I mean the generation label and u and d because the left handed sides of these guys transform together is an su2 left doublet. The right handed parts are just two separate right handed guys that transform in. Singlet of SU2 left, because it's right-handed in our mass, right? Good. 
So this is the fermion. This is all the fermions I have. What else do I have? Higgs. Scalar field, Higgs. What's the, what's the uh, representation of that? One trivial in SU3. And SU2 left, it has to be, it has to be doublet, yes. Because, I mean, yeah. And then the charge is whatever is the charge, minus half, right. All right, just we worked out an example. QED electron is a Dirac spinner, E left and E right. These are like wild components, right? But we, we're going to we're going to package them as two Majorana fields, left-handed and right-handed Majoranas this way, as I advocated before. And um, the left-handed side of this guy, so actually the neutrino is the R left-handed, and the left-handed side of this guy, right, E L, e -L are going to sit together in a doublet that transform under SU2L as fundamental. There are no right-handed neutrinos. Good. All right. Here's some notation. New M are the left-handed neutrinos. Each new M is a one Majorana. Because they're only left handed Majoranas, right? And EM are the electron muon tau for the index M, right? And they're split into two Majoranas this way. For the quarks, up quarks and down quarks, well, I don't know, UMs and DMs are split and each have two pairs of Majoranas, right? Two pairs, one pair of Majoranas. Good? So this is the particle content, at least, the well, the fermions. Here are the representations. The leptons, PRs, of course, their lepton is one. PR is SU2 is left, is one. The charge of this guy is minus, hypercharge of this guy is minus one. These hypercharges you can't guess, right? It's minus one. These are leptons, one, two is a doublet, it's clear. We said that we organize all these, the notation we're using here is organized all in the representations of SU2 left. I write vectors, I write a representation of SU2 left. Why? Because it's the one that we're going to spontaneously break and is going to be like more involved, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that the whole point is that the charge of these guys is minus, hypercharge of this is minus half. The uh, left-handed quarks, PL, UM, and DM, the curly versions are three, two, six and then the right handed ones are three one two third one minus one third good all right uh there are the right handed versions which are the conjugates of course and they have the uh they're the complex conjugates so the charges are going to be flipped for the hypercharge good the gauge bosons uh representation is uh adjoint eight one, zero, one, three, right? Three, yeah, zero. Well, I'm not sure if I should write it in this way, actually, as a matter of fact. I don't think this is a good notation. This is not a good notation. I didn't say this. Adjoint representation, adjoint representation, adjoint representation. The Higgs is the important one. One, it's a complex scalar field, which is a doublet in SU2 left. It better be a doublet because it's going to break it, right? And it has a hypercharge. It carries hypercharge minus half, and it doesn't see color. It's color blind, right? Now, spontaneous symmetry breaking of SU2 left times hypercharge U1 down to U, U electromagnetic U1 is going to involve giving a web to uh, vacuum expectation value of F to the Higgs field, complex scalar. Right, we're gonna describe that today. All right, what's the Lagrangian? I think I've described it to you, but let's just write this again and repeat yet another time. Here is the term for the uh, yang mill term, right? For SU3, color. Here's the yang mill term for SU2. Here is just the standard Oh,
um, standard Yang Mills term for the U1. This line is leptons, right? This line is hadrons, quarks. So the leptons, the left and the ones are this, the left and the maronas are these guys, right and the maronas are these guys, left and the maronas, right and the maronas. Left handed one splits into the left handed piece and the antiparticle that I put in by hand, which transform in the with the opposite hypercharge, right? So you could just draw these pictures all, put all the representations, but this is what their representation is. Now, these things that I've written down here tells you what D slash is. Good? Is it clear? I wrote the D slashes in these cases explicitly before, but now hopefully you can write down D slash for these EMs based on these representations. Like for example here, D slash is what? Is gamma mu del mu, I gamma mu del mu, right? And then there's a piece to it. Well, you remember this, right? All right, any questions about the Lagrangian of standard model? This is a gauge part, sorry. It's not the full thing, yeah. Instead of a complex scalar field, I would take the Higgs to be a real scalar field. Uh, you would take what? I would take the Higgs to be a real scalar field. It's a real scalar field, okay. Yes, so how would the representation or what would the Higgs change in that case? Uh, if you, well, actually, you'll, you'll, you'll see in a second. Uh, Higgs field, so that this phi is a complex scalar that transforms in uh, one, two, minus half. But as we saw in the case of spontaneous symmetry with gauge fields, right? What we're going to do is that we're going to look at the phi one and phi two, right? We're going to give expectation value to phi. Sorry, I don't know what notation I was using before. I think my, my notation before phi, phi 2 was pure gauge. Phi 1 was up. Oh, I flipped it here. Anyway, so this is going to be V plus some chi. And this is going to be phi 2. If you remember, in arc C gauge C going to infinity that we call unitary gauge, we'll just set this to zero, right? To get rid of this. As a matter of fact, in the unitary gauge, you further learn that this guy can be, this is the Higgs, it becomes real, right? So this whole issue of real versus complex will go away. After gauge fixing, in the unitary gauge, this is just a real scaling. So it's just a matter of gauge fixing? Yeah, it's a matter of gauge fixing. But you should have enough, the complex scaling field to start with, it has enough degrees of freedom so that you're left with some. Yeah. Any other questions? This is, by the way, this is the simplest form of Higgs. There are more sophisticated versions of Higgs, but this does the job. Nothing in standard model tells you that this must be the theory. This is more like Arkham's razor kind of thing, right? This is a minimal small set of assumptions that will describe nature. Now, as we discover, do more precision tests, we might have to come up with something more funky. All right? Any other questions? Am I going fast? Or you guys remember? It's been a while. Okay. All right. Now, here comes the thing. We never discussed this up to here. But if I have another really engaged theory, this is the yang Mills term. But there is another term I can write down which is also gauge invariant. In electromagnetism, U1 gauge theory, what is this term? Do you remember? E dot B, exactly, it's E dot B. Do you remember what it causes? Okay, let me not give you too much. I'll, I'll explain, sorry? Actions. Actions, yeah. Um, but, Another way of saying it is that it breaks a discrete symmetry. CP. Exactly. The CP breaking. When we described when we described in QFT1 symmetries, right? We talked about the Poincare group, but we put this function, this up and one 
Remember? That was the, com the, com the connected component because there were four different components. Then what relates these different components are CPT, right? Now, it's a matter of, I guess, principles. We have to go into nature and test. We have tested Poincaré transformations. We know there are symmetries, right? But whether these are discrete symmetries or not, we have to test, right? If they are, if CP is a symmetry of nature, this term is not allowed. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this. Yeah, I have one thing. What we say is that we want CPT to be constant, right? But we don't. No, CPT is always constant. Yeah, CPT is always constant. It's a symmetry of quantum fields here, theory. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, what is, but we never had any strong statement which told us that CP should be conserved. So, what there's is no principle. Yeah, CPT being conserved is that being symmetry to prove it. From representation theory of Poincaré group, low aspect. But nothing tells you that CP individually should be symmetry. Yes. So, then what is the problem with the second term? That's what I'm saying. Well, CP violated. Yeah, but it can violate CP. Yeah, nature might. The, the model you're discussing might. No, you see, you want to model a system. What was the principle of quantum field theory? Write down the action. It's, the symbols action that's local, consistent with your symmetries and expanded in derivative terms and field ours goes into the construction symmetries. You gotta decide what the symmetries are. If CP is a symmetry, then no, not allowed. If it's not a symmetry, allowed, right? You allow and in this framework of EFT, anything that's consistent with all the symmetries and is at the right order, you, you write down, right? It's also second order in A. Okay, so it's gauge invariant. You got to check that. So if this term is allowed, is, by the way, this coefficient conventional, G is the G of the Yang, the regular G here. So I've introduced a new uh, coefficient here, theta. We have SU3 times SU2 times U1. SU3, this is a coupling. SU2, this is a coupling. This is SU1 coupling. We have theta1, theta2, theta3 in principle. Turns out that theta1 and theta2 have no observable consequences for standard model. But we'll, we'll get that. Uh, in principle, you could add these terms. But you know, like if you're not talking as theorists, you might not be talking about our nature. You might be talking about a different nature. All right. So they're allowed. Any questions about this term? We'll, we'll spend quite a bit of time on this term later. Um, coupling? That's a coupling. But we usually put it in this convention. We put G squared, we'll G squared over 64 pi squared out. Because there are, you have three gauge theories. Oh, and Stanimal, this this part about Stanimal. You have G1, G2, G3. Yeah, sorry, this is a little bit confusing. Yeah. So QCD, electro weak, say the one theory, right? All right. No mass term is allowed for fermions. They break gauge invariance. Why? This is a very important point. And we're going to spend the next section of the after Samuel is all about this. SU2 left. We wanted to gauge the left handed part, but not the right handed part. This is only possible if you do not have a master. Mass would spoil this. Here's an example take EM. Do you remember in my notation what EM was? was the SU2 left doublet for the electron left-handed neutrino and left-handed electron, right? No, is that, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. That was not my notation. What was the, whoops. The right-handed one. Right-handed one, sorry, right-handed one. Thank you. So it's only, it only has hypercharge, yeah. 
Let's say I add a math term here. I'm just going to put PLF plus PR in the middle. What's the hypercharge of, for example, PR here? This guy has hypercharge minus one. We just saw that. The representation is one, one, minus one. This is this antiparticle, actually. Oh, it's, it's sorry. <laughs> this is the antiparticle of P left. This is the antiparticle of the left hand part. So this guy will have hypercharge minus one as well. The hypercharge of this whole thing is minus two. It breaks U1 hypercharge. This is one example, but none of the fermions can have mass unless we spontaneously break symmetry. It's a very, very important thing. So standard molar particle physics, before ACE was discovered, which was when I got my PhD, uh, basically there was no good explanation of masses in the universe for fermions or bosons for that matter. There was no scalar field discovered at that time. And we didn't really know what, if there was a good mechanism for it. Well, we knew there was a good mechanism, theoretically well motivated, but we hadn't observed it yet. Spontaneous symmetry wrecking was advocated as a way of giving masses to everything. And it was very nice because as I'm going to go through this, at the time Higgs was not seen, but the structure of Higgs is so special that the masses that come out because of gauge invariance, it's not an arbitrary theory, it's spontaneously broken gauge invariance. The masses will have a very special form. As a matter of fact, well, you'll see. Uh, so, so, okay, so, say it again. So, it's a hypercharge of this. So, this is a mass term that I've added. It's a term in the Lagrangian. It must be gauge invariant. So, you should have hypercharge zero. All charges zero. Gauge invariance means charge zero. Every term in, yeah, right? Here is the projected projection to a right handed part. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is a projection I just scored. Yeah. Sorry, I, I think I should explain. No masses are allowed for fermions. And it has to do with SU2 left. The moment you put left over there. So we're going to come back to this. Before we discuss standard model, we never talked about chiral theories. Right? When we talked about left and right movers, uh, sorry, left-handed fermion and right-handed fermions, whether they're Maron or uh, Weil, right? We saw that the representation theory was reducible. So it's imaginable to just have one of them and not the other one. Such a theory would be for chiral, right? Now, it's an interesting question to ask, uh, how do you quantize chiral theories? This is a symmetry that's at the level of classical. Could there be chiral anomaly? Could there, could you have chiral symmetry that is quantum mechanically broken? This is all classical at the level of Lagrangian, right? I'm just describing Lagrangian. This is going to be the topic of the next step, section. And the motivation from it comes from the fact that we do have a chiral looking theory in sample, right? We have chiral modes. We're separating, separating left-handed modes and right-handed modes. We, one of them we're gauging, the other one we're not, right? So, yeah. Even though I wrote this classically, it's unclear that quantum corrections will preserve the structure. We'll have to show that. We'll, we're going to prove that there are no anomalies and. Uh, sound model is anomaly free because we just I just put it in the Lagrangian, right? There are quantum corrections, stuff running the loops, and we have to make sure everything is fine, right? What does it mean to remember? I give you a, def a very high level definition of what anomaly is. Can you remember what was it? What was it? Def what does it mean to say you have an anomaly? Your measurement not integrated with the that's a one very way, great way of saying it. Another way of saying it, and that's a very non-perturbative way. 
Another way of saying it, we saw it in perturbation theory. What was this manifestation in perturbation theory? We couldn't regulate the theory in such a way that respected the symmetries. We couldn't, we could never do the loop integrals using a regulator that respected the symmetries. All right, we're gonna come back to that. We're gonna discuss that. So the next lecture is gonna be stand, still standard model, but the one after we're gonna to switch to uh, Carl anomaly. So we're gonna discuss anomaly. Most importantly, we're gonna discuss Carl anomaly and then scale anomaly. All right, good. So all permeans are either singlet or doublet of SU2. So we consider complex scalar field as SU2 left doublet, right? Here's a complex scalar field phi as phi plus phi naught, phi tilde is minus phi naught star, minus phi plus star. Um, sorry that I have changed notation. I'll get rid of this notation very quickly now. So the representations are this way. All right. So we wrote down the gauge and the fermion part. All that I have to add to it is the Higgs action. It's a complex scalar field. This is the usual kinetic term. I think I was putting a half in front of it, but I'm um, terribly consistent with those things. <laughs> v of phi dagger phi, right? Then I can have Yukawa terms, which is phi coupling to fermion anti fermion, right? I can couple this to my leptons, or I can couple it to my quarks. and Hermitian conjugates. So I'm gonna end up with three sets of these guys. So the left-handed ones, there are these Yukawa couplings, F, M, N. For now, I've taken these guys to be the couplings to be cross-generation because I can, because it's allowed, right? So F, M, N means that I'm coupling uh, leptons of different generations. We had another word for generation, flavor, right? So for example, if the things of this type are allowed, it would be something along these lines that an electron comes, interacts with the Higgs, and goes out a uh, muon. We'll have to see if such things are visible. Turns out that no. Turns out that you can diagonalize these terms. So there won't be any flavor change. That's almost by definition. You could diagonalize one of these guys. These guys. So I'm, I'm writing it this way to just write something provocative because we're going to see later on that they're going to see we're going to see interaction with the weak sector where the flavor changes. Not for now. Not with Higgs. We're going to see flavor changing stuff. So. All right. There are no Yukawa terms coupling, for example, left arm, Higgs, and uh, atom. What kind, does the representation theory work? Yeah, I, I just want to confirm that because I don't have four. Right, that. but, but let, let's think about it. A quark would be in three of SU3. Lepton is not charged. The only way that could work is if Higgs was at a color. But it right. doesn't. Okay. But in principle, you could have had a four term, like, Quark, anti-quark, it will be really complicated, right? Higgs and something else. But it's not up to me. The gauge theory fixes everything else, right? I, yeah. Your colors are up to me. Yeah, but it's the interaction term for Higgs quark thick. Is it okay? Remember? Oh, this was just the simplest spontaneous symmetry breaking Mexican hat kind of thing that we wrote down. And it works for standard model. This is enough. It was the simplest thing possible. It works. But you know you know why it works though. Right? Do you know why, why it works? Okay. Why did we why do people write this down? We have SU2 left times uh U1 hypercharge that want to break down to something. First, am I gonna break down SU3 color? No, why? Sometimes gluons have been also to be massless. We want gluons to be massless. Yes, that's very important. Right? 
Okay, so that's I'm not gonna touch that. I'm gonna take SU two left times SU one hyper times SU one U one hypercharge, and I'm gonna break it down to what U one because I see a boson. No, sorry, I see I see a photon. I still have a U one in my low energy, right? That's the spontaneous symmetry breaking that I want. All right, so I have a doublet for my scale field. that fixes the representation theory of phi up to only the charge. Uh, you want hypercharge, right? Now I have to write down a Hamilton uh, 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 potential. I'm going to take it to be smooth. Write down the simplest, but whatever it, the potential is, I'm just going to expand the powers of phi. And we show this dip. The simplest thing I can cook up is this. A lot of other Hamiltonians, a lot of other potentials could be approximated this way when you look at the small uh, phi. We can also power six and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but those actually now like yeah. Yes. All right. We we've gone through all this these shenanigans for a reason, right? Like you've seen all sorts of things that you could do. Well, the problem with Higgs as a complex scalar field is that the symmetry is not large. So it's easy to get something that's nonsense. Right? Here gauge theory comes. It saves you. Okay, it looks like a 5 4 term, right? But gauge theory helps you. Right? We saw that gauge theory, non abelian gauge theory, we saw that they have anti, uh, what do we call it? Anti screening. Um, all right, I'm over explaining. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to get to the perturbative spectrum. What does, what's, what does perturbative spectrum mean? Mean that I'm just first got what is what's the word spectrum? Spectral particles. In this context, yeah, particles. Spectrum here means particles, right? E reps. I'm just gonna organize my E reps. We're gonna organize everything in as E reps of Poincare group, right? What are they labeled for by in 4D3 plus one? Representation of Poincare group is labeled by no. You're Lorenz. No, I didn't say Lorenz. I said I said Poincare. Spin and mass. Spin and mass, right? So I have to give you the masses as well. Yeah, the, it was a Lorenz group that we got. Spontaneous symmetry breaking is easier in unitary gauge, which I just said that I, I apologize that I dropped, I, was, I brought this down, I sw switched them too. So we're gonna, uh, oops. We're gonna set phi two to zero or phi one to zero. We saw that that was a unitary gauge. If you recall, it was arc C gauge at C going to infinity. RQC gauge generally gets rid of this term, right? But it had an extra thing in there, a term in the Lagrangian, right? Remember what it was? The RQC gauge, yeah. there was the del mu a mu squared. There was a C or, or that. Right, but when I take, anyway, KC to infinity, that oh. thing just drops. All right, so here's V is my, Vacuum expectation value, which is the minimum of the, minimum of the potential, is just a constant, read this way. It's just a constant. Well, sorry. Is it a constant or does it have a dimension? What's the dimension of it? Look at this. And it has to be a dimension that's Higgs. What's the dimension of Higgs? Higgs is a real scalar field. Hx here is a real scalar field. What would be the dimension of it? V minus two over two, right? Which is one. So V is dimension full. I have to, when I code, if, if I coded the number, just tell me what are the units, right? And I'll tell you what the units are. What are the units? Mass, right? So I'm just gonna give it to you in, G, V, M, E, V, or something like that. Expect that. All right, 
so del mu of phi, phi doesn't have color charge, right? So this is the d mu of phi. This is the del mu part of it, right? And then here is the gauge part of it. I've written it as SU2 left doublet, right? Here's the SU2 left doublet times U1 hypercharge. I've just squeezed the U1 hypercharge in there as well, right? Diagonally. Because it couples the same way. It's just like both of them are, right? Is this term clear? Is this uh, covariant there is it clear? This was actually W mu of A. Tau of A, but these tau of A's are basically Pauli matrices, hence this form, right? I joined your presentation of SU2. All right. Let's take the, the covariant derivative of phi dagger, the covariant kinetic term for phi, and expand it as we did in spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So, what I'm describing to you is electric symmetry breaking. You're going to get the Higgs term, the Higgs uh, kinetic term for the real scalar, V plus H squared, G2 squared. So just to clarify, G2 is the coupling of the SU2 left gauge field, right? And this is the structure of the sigma 1, tau 1, tau 2, right? There's V plus H that couples B mu and W3 of mu separate differently. Yeah, this is a structure. I, I've just, I'm just literally taking this and expanding it and taking the multiplication of this matrix by stag. But now we know this one thing. This V sitting next to these W squares will give mass to the W bosons. I've been avoiding the term W boson because I'm just going to define for you what W boson is. I'm just so far using W as a notation. And this H is going to give you a coupling of Higgs to the SU2 gauge boson. Right? So this term couples Higgs to the SU2 gauge boson, and this term couples it, uh, gives you gives W boson a mass. Good. What is the potential term? The potential term expanded gives you this, which is a mass term for the Higgs. It's fixed by lambda V squared. V is the vacuum expectation value. There's a H cube term and H quadrant. These are self interactions. So we give, we get the oh, H squared term. H4 terms, right? The propagator with this mass, the three point and the four point. Yeah. The, does the second line in the mm -hmm. dv pi squared term show that uh, w3 and g 2 have mass? Yes, yes, they do. Yes and no, but we'll see. Uh, there's a reason I didn't say it here. Yeah. So now the Yukawa coupling will look like, like this. So for example, I picked one of the terms, right? That couples to a lepton, it couples the phi to the leptons, right? And uh, this is the expansion of it. It will give a mass to the leptons and a Higgs coupling to leptons, right? Just in your head, hopefully you, you are drawing Feynman diagrams already, right? What they look like. Higgs also couples to quarks. Again, through the Yukawa. So what are we learning here? We're learning that just the kinetic term for, this, for the Higgs gives masses to the SU2 left gauge, uh, gauge boson. But no mass, and then there will be masses and self-interactions for the Higgs if I want to give masses, if I want Higgs to give masses to my leptons and hadrons, I must include the Yukawa terms, right? I just by hand added them, right? And that's why I did this. 
we're doing phenomenology. <laughs> I'm writing down a quantum field theory that's supposed to describe nature. I add terms until I can describe everything I have. Right? So that's why I included the Yukawa terms. And I'm going to introduce the minimum number of parameters in the Yukawa that I need. Right? Is that is that concept clear? All right. So I give give masses to uh, hadrons to my 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 I, I, no I shouldn't have used the word hadrons to quarks, and I give masses to my leptons, and of course you can give mass to it, but not coupled to Higgs. Right? It comes as a package. Whatever gets mass is also coupled to Higgs, because gluons are not are remain massless. There is no vertex that just makes them talk to Higgs, right? We don't see that vertex. All right, the total Higgs action is this. This is a lambda phi four or H four H three gauge field with particular form of couplings. Right, there are three terms, but only two free variables. These are all fixed by gauge invariance principle. This is the W one W two. Gauge, sorry, the gauge boson for SU2 left the first one and two components of it. This is the three and four, three and B mu components, right? And here are the uh, mass terms. Uh, sorry, are these, yeah, these are the mass terms for my uh, fermions. No, sorry, these are the mass and the uh, coupling terms between the fermions and Higgs. But you see that because I got this out of spontaneous breaking, these coefficients have to match up to these. You see, there are all sorts of relations. These are not arbitrary parameters. Which time? You cover coefficients. Let me, let me show it. So here. Yeah, I just said, I even took them to be cross-generation, right? I'm, I'm, I don't need to. I can diagonalize them. The reason I took them to be cross-generational is that the textbook I was stealing these from took them to be cross-generation. No, but the reality is that there are, there's flavor-changing stuff and sana model. We're gonna see that. That's why. Not at this level. We'll work, or that's that's gonna be next lecture. Actually. All right. So the spectrum. Spectrum are particles that are irreps of Poincaré groups. So spin and mass. Spin zero. I have the Higgs, which is a real scalar field with this mass. Right. Spin one. I have the W A boson. W one. W mu one and W mu two, they end up getting the same mass this way. It's not a coincidence that they get the same mass under the spontaneous symmetric breaking. It has to do with the fact that the U one remains unbroken. This U one is the U one of electromagnetism. If I further broke this, W1 and W2 will end up having different masses. So what are the gauge transformation we're talking about? Of course, these are these have nothing to do with SU3. Remember, so W3 is the SU3 gauge thing. W2A is a, remember alpha is the SU3, it runs from one to eight, A runs from one to three, and this is just that thing. So this gauge symmetry we're talking about, to just see it, Take it, take these guys to be independent of X and W1 equal W23, third component of W2. And this guy's zero. This is still a, a, a redundancy of the description. Because you're taking W1 equal W23, the charge corresponding to this is the third component, T3 part of SU2 left plus the hypercharge. We're breaking SU2 left times U1 hypercharge down to U1 electromagnetic. I know this is really fast, but you're going to do homework and slow down and go through this. Yeah. 
W3 alpha is what? Sorry, again. W3 alpha is what? Double, so the gauge transformations, these are the gauge transformations uh, of uh, uh, QCD, right? The SL2 is this, and W1s have to do with U1 hypercharge. You see, each of them have to do with a function worth of things, right? So, sorry, maybe maybe this is way too quick, right? So for for QED, I don't know why it's not writing. For QED, you do this, right? Minus I, I don't know. For example, who cares? Del mu omega, right? I put a one here for the hypercharge. If it was SL2, it would be something like this. I put a two here. If it's SU3, I put a three there, right? So this gauge, uh, I don't know what's going on here. My computer is not doing, okay. This means that do not make a gauge transformation in SU3. Do not make a gauge transformation in SU2, the first and the second component. Make a gauge transformation in the SU2 third component, which is equal to the U1 hypercharge one, right? That's why the charge is like this. Good. As I said, the homeworks will slow you down, slow me or you down, either. I, I, they have slowed me down in the past. That's why I'm older than you guys. All right. Um, because W1 and W2 are have the same mass, to make things a little bit more, to present things a little bit nicer, it's easy, it's convenient to define the W boson as a W plus minus mu as complex conjugates of each other. So we write W mu one minus plus I W mu two. This is our mass term. This is the mass. G2 V over two. I want you guys to remember this, the structure of it is G2, which was the coupling of S U to left. V over two, V was the expectation value of uh, Higgs. Sorry, something I'm saying here is, huh, I'm sorry, I said, I think, I think I'm missing. Yeah, no, this is, this is, this is wrong. You know why I know it's wrong? Energy. Dimension counting. So V has dimension energy. G has dimension what? Three. Zero, it's not a building gauge theory, right? In four dimensions, it's supposed to be scaling very classically, right? All the shenanigans, all the stuff we discussed. So this is the right dimension. Also, you see this here. So this is another cheat to know I have a typo. All right. So now we have one more boson, which is G1 B mu minus G2 del mu three. We define the Z boson. So this is the W, when we talk about the W boson, we think of, we often talk, refer to this complex vector field, this double thing back. Z boson is this beast. We define the theta weak as cosine theta weak is G2 over square root G1 plus G2 squared, right? This is a way of, instead of talking about the, because of spontaneous unit breaking, which is mixes the degrees of freedom of SU2 and U1 hypercharge, it's more convenient instead of talking about G1 and G2, talk about G1 over square root G1 2 plus G2 2 and the other one, which are organized as cosine and sine, right? So you in the standard model, we often talk about uh, theta of double. We love theta. There is every, we write everything in terms of theta. I don't know why. Call everything theta. All right, so there will be more theta, just to confuse you. All right, so this is one way of writing it down. Finally, 
we have the massless gauge field, the photon, which is the perpendicular one, right? It's W mu three sine theta W plus, I put it this way, B mu, so it's basically this combination. Does the counting work? Yes, it does. We started with four degrees of freedom, W mu A, A one, two, three, and B mu, that's four degrees of freedom, we broke it to W plus minus Z, these two are mass, Z mu, these are massive, right? And a photon. So we're good. This is the U1, this electromagnetism, right? This was related to SU2 left times U1 hypercharge. All of them were massless. We broke it down to this, this is got to remain massless but this has m v squared, this has m z squared. My two and z's are very similar. Good. Of course, I did not touch SU3, so gluons are massless, and I have eight of them. In summary, this is my gauge spectrum, uh, sorry, vector field uh, boson spectrum. Oh, it just, there wasn't one. I didn't, I did, the, here, here, just expand it. There are just only three masses here. Just expand it, yeah. I will make sure. I'll try to remember so to have this very explicit homework problem because it's important. It's important. There's like we don't have time to go to write on the board. Um, we had a when I took quantum field theory, the professors who taught it because it was co-taught. We went through this in detail, and he had like color chalk and kept track of every sign. But it was like ten lectures for standard model. So, all right, fermion masses. So we described the spectrum of spin one and spin zero particles, right? Spin was spin zero was basically Higgs. There was mass self interactions, uh, and then spin one we described what they are. Now we have to talk about the spin half. So the fermion masses come from the Yukawa coupling. We said that after field redefinition, we diagonalize these guys, no problemo. So we have F M G M and H M. So that these Yukawa couplings are non-mixing generations or flavors, right? So they're flavor diagonal. It's, I'm gonna save you guys some time. You will have to go through the whole structure of SU2 left and right, uh, right mode, Marana left, all of that. You do that, expand it. This is the form of it. It's most elegantly written in terms of Dirac fermions. You wouldn't be surprised because the, Mass term explicitly breaks the symmetry, right? Um, so it's, it's most elegantly written, in my opinion, in terms of the drag fermions, F, M, G, M, H, M. Notice that there's a V sitting outside. So the mass term comes from V times the Yukawa. One thing that you've seen by now, well, actually, I'll comment on that. There's a V explicitly in every mass. And V carries the dimension. Well, is part of the dimension. So if you want, for example, expand this term, this is what it looks like. Yeah, okay, you will, you'll figure this out. All right, so now let's actually define what hadrons are. <laughs> so now let's take a break from SU2 and talk about a new one and talk about SU3 color. We said that G3, uh, SU3 is, uh, Asymptotically free, so the coupling grows in the IR, right? So G3 becomes strong. It turns out that the arrangement of couplings are such that it becomes strong at about 500 MeV. What's the mass of a proton? Sorry? GV? No. 0.5 MeV. 0.5 MeV. 
<laughs> All right, you will look this up. I'll 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 make sure I'll put you know, your oven still orders a magnitude. I'll make sure I'll put some uh numbers out there. But remember for now, remember one number 500 MeV or half a GV. Half a GV is the only reference point so far for you, right? Half a GV is not very high energy. But we said that at this scale, the theory becomes strongly coupled. Quarks and gluons are gonna, the theory confines, so quarks and gluons are not gonna be visible individually, right? So we're gonna see bound states. Here's some terminology. Bound states of only gluons are called glue balls. This is a phenomenon which is fully non-abelian, right? Because photons do not self-interact, you can't have a bound state for them. Non-abelian gauge boson, gluons, or you know, whatever the hell they are, they are called, they can form at strong coupling bound states, only glue, gluons. They're called glue balls. So it's a bound state, so it's two or more particles. These are highly non perturbative There's no, to my understanding, no, no simple derivation of all this stuff. If you have a theory of pure Yang-Mills, pure non abelian gauge theory, no matter field, the theory becomes strong at low energies. It confines. All the low energy excitations are glue balls. There are no quarks by definition. I said it's just pure Yang-Mills. But if you put matter in there, now you could have bound states of QQ bar, quark antiquark. Of course, there's gluons in there as well, right? These are called mesons. Example, up down bar is pi plus meson, down up bar is pi minus meson, pi zero meson is up up bar minus down down bar. Good. People love to discuss entanglement with setups because I don't know, they have to justify funding. I did not say that about the court. <laughs> Bound states of three or more quarks are called baryons. Example up, up, down. You have heard of that object called proton. Up, down, down is neutron. Good. So, electroweak, beta decay, what is the phenomenon that describes it? We don't have much time. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, okay, never mind. Never mind. I wouldn't I will get farther. All right. Um, all right. Interactions. This is going to be the next lecture, but regarding the interactions of Santa model, we're going to expand everything, blah, blah, blah. We could do that homework, but I want to point, highlight a few key things that we're going to go through. But before going through them, I want to highlight them. Charged current interactions, remember those words, neutral current interactions, and Kobayashi Masakawa matrix. Three things. We're going to go through these three in the next lecture. There are tons of interaction terms. You can play with them. But these are the three things I want you guys to remember. It will be a topic of the next lecture for the most part. But for now, let's just organize interaction terms a little bit. The Higgs-Higgs interactions look like this, H cube, H4. But in writing these interactions, I'm writing everything in terms of the following structure, mass of the particle and V, expectation value of uh, X, yeah, right? And I want you to notice this, that how the mass of the particle and expectation value of X, V, fits everything. So M of the H cube term is MH squared over 2V. It's just dimensional analysis, pretty much. This is MH2 over V2. This is H over V plus H2 over 2 V2. MW2, MZ2. This two has to do with the fact that it's a complex field and that we define that, that particular way we define things. 
This is the Higgs gauge boson. It could be written very compactly this way. Higgs fermion, sum over fermion. There are 12 of them. Nine Dirac fermions. E, U, D, M's. Three Majorana fermions, uh, and three Majoranas, which are the new M's. So these are F bar FH. These are three point vertices. The coupling is MF over V, always for all of them. Things to know this all particles coupled to Higgs proportional to this coefficient, mass of the particle over V. V is the second number to remember. 246 GeV. What was the previous number? And what was it? Where QCD becomes strong. How much larger is this? This is 500 times larger. This is a scale where electroweak symmetry breaking occurs, and that's where QED is, QCD is strong. QCD is strong, at that scale, it means that we have a, like a zoo of hadrons, bound states. And these guys are all at the regime which is way low energy compared to electroweak symmetry breaking. What does that mean? It means that the mass of the electroweak bosons, W and Z, are going to be naturally set by the electroweak energy symmetry breaking scale, which is really high, much larger than the masses of the hadrons, right? So is the, is the structure clear? It mean, Basically the idea to have in mind that electroweak symmetry breaking is very higher, much higher energy scale than where QCD becomes strong. So QCD becoming strong gives you like an EFT of all sorts of bound states. And these bound states are have a lot less energy or mass compared to electroweak symmetry breaking. Another way of saying it, this is that the gauge W and Z bosons are very massive. All right, now the so this V, oops, this V is a very very large number, right? Mass over V for all these quark, these hadrons is small, so the hadrons are coupled to Higgs very very weakly. The heavier the particle is, the larger its coupling to Higgs is, the more non-perturbative it is. Perturbation theory works like charm if mass is small because the coupling is M over V. Small compared to what? 246 GV. So hadrons are very nice. Their coupling to uh, Higgs is very, very perturbative. The only particle in standard model which left on that gives us uh, a lot of trouble as top quark because this mass is 173 GV. So 173 over 246 is not a very small number, even for a physicist. <laughs> Higgs fermion interactions are flavor diagonal. Fermion comes, fermion bar goes, H goes. M doesn't change. The only flavor changing interactions in standard model are through W plus minus. We'll discuss that next time. Higgs couplings are CPT symmetric. We don't have much time. You guys think about what that means, but it's easy, right? These are terms in the Lagrangian. We act with CPT on them. The action of CPT on fermion was a little bit tricky, but we did, we did that. We went through that. Strong interactions also preserve CPT symmetry, except for theta three, that we call strong CP parameter because it violates CP symmetry. Bounds from the experiment, ooh, I just broke my, bounds from experiments on the strong CP parameter tell you that it's dimensionless, of course, is smaller than 10 to minus nine as a dimensionless Coupler. So that's a very small number for physicists or not. We need to explain that somehow. 
So CP symmetry is there in, in uh, SU3 color for whatever reason. G3 controls all strong interactions. I went through the interact, or quickly went through the interactions of Higgs with fermions and everything. I'm oh, sorry, uh, interact interaction of Higgs with quarks and self interactions. The only things I haven't described are electroweak interactions with Higgs, right? That is going to be the topic of the next lecture. And then we're going to discuss that. We're just going to discuss the symmetries of standard model systematically. And hopefully that will be the end of the conversation for standard model. I'll comment a little bit on beyond standard model physics, the open problems, there are tons of them. I mean, it depends how much you care about these things, but yeah. All right, any questions? Oh, I said, I just categorically said they don't have any observable, theta one and theta two do not have any observable consequences. But I didn't justify it. I just didn't deal with them for now. I've not justified that. I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. Yeah. You know, you saw the strong interactions because of the CP symmetry. Say it again. So here, just in this part, I'm a bit confused. So here, we are saying that strong interactions preserve the CP symmetry. Yeah. Uh, experimentally tested. Up to very good accuracy. Then the anomaly term shouldn't be there, right? Then the anomaly term. We don't need to. So yeah. I mean, we've not discussed the anomaly yet, right? So this is at the classical level, right? CP could have been a symmetry or not. And we see that it looks like it's a good symmetry. Up to, like, it's been tested with that accuracy. For the strong force sector, right? We're not saying that this is a full stand model. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. So we can have the electric anomaly because it's got nothing to do with the strong center. Okay. So here we are discussing whether it's a classical symmetry or not. Anomaly would, would be saying this. I know this is my Lagrangian. Now I'm going to quantize it and see whether the symmetry is going to preserve. Uh, is symmetry preserved? under uh, and the loose, right? But we're, at this point, we're still debating. So there is a, there is a, there's a distinction between explicit violation of the symmetry and anomaly. Here we're discussing explicit violation of anomaly. Explicit violation means that there's just a no symmetry to start with. Yeah? All right, so any other questions? I'm just gonna quickly summarize what we did. Uh, I remember actually what we did. Uh, we went through the particle content. Uh, there is a scalar field, which is a complex scalar uh, that is Higgs. It transforms in one comma two comma minus half. <clears throat> That's Higgs. It has self interactions. Uh, that we, in in unitary gauge, it fixed uh, one of the components, the pure gauge, to be zero. The other one becomes a V, which was how much? 100, 246 GeV, it's a very, very large number, right? Um, plus a real scalar field, that's the component that survives, that we call Higgs, right? Uh, Higgs ends up with a mass term with a, a cubic interaction and quartic interaction um, that we organize very, very nicely this way, right? So basically, it seems like every so the the kinetic the mass term is minus m h two over two h three. I'm just for every extra power, I'm adding one over v. Right. The uh we we talked about the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of ele electroweak symmetry breaking of s u two left times u one hypercharge down to u one electromagnetic. This is a uh, non-diagonal thing, the surviving U1 is generated by the charge, which is T3 plus Q. Q is, the, sorry, what do they call it? No, T3 plus Y. Y. Y is the hypercharge. 
T3 is the third component of, uh, of SU2 charges uh, left. Uh, then what, what else did we say? Um, yeah, then this gives masses to the W bosons, W1 and 2 end up having the same mass. That's why uh, we, we put them together into a complex vector field, W plus and minus, complex conjugates of each other. Uh, Z boson ends up being a W3, a mixture of W3 with some theta W angle with uh, B mu, which was a U1 hypercharge so U1 hypercharge gauge boson. The other com combination, the orthogonal combination, ends up being the A mu of uh, photon, which is massless because we haven't broken that U1. Um, the interaction, Higgs has inter induces interactions to fermions and bosons, and this is the structure of it. The key observations here was that uh, the coupling to every, this is a key idea that you have to keep in mind about standard model. The key couple, the coupling of Higgs to, uh, a lot of couplings are fixed by gauge symmetry, right? The, the scalar is the weirdest part. The coupling of scalar to the other fields is proportional to M over V. This is a dimensionless parameter. It's a dimensionless parameter, which is small. If the mass of the particle is significantly smaller, than electroweak, for example, hadrons, right? Because the electroweak symmetry breaking, I'm oh, sorry, because the uh, QCD was getting strong at much lower energy scales, half GV, 500 MeV. All right, um, we talked about potentially adding a CP violating term, say the one, say the two, say the three. This is a non-abelian analog of uh, E dot B term. Right, and we will get back to that in a bit. All right, any last questions? Sorry, I went, I went over time. You said uh, writing those fermions in terms of the Majorana spin and six plus the choice of basis, but mm -hmm. then what it means to say something like uh, the neutrinos are Majorana type? Oh, so we only have left handed neutrinos. So what does it mean? It means that neutrinos only have two components. And, uh, you know, like as a, as a spinner, as a, a vector field in space-time, it could have four components, right? As in four degrees of freedom, but it only has two degrees of freedom. Now, I can either describe it as left degree, uh, like wild mode, or I can just create a pair, the other pair by hand. But the important thing is the counting of the number of degrees of freedom, right? It's just two degrees of freedom. There's only one pair, right? It's about like a sort of like choice of basis. It's really a choice of basis. You could, if you have a two dimensional vector space, subspace of a three dimension, you can talk about one, zero, 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 one, zero. This is a two dimensional thing. Or you could talk about uh, this, right? It's like your, your choice. It's a, it's a field redefinition. But the important part is that the coupling, there's a reason I, I, I like Majorana because the transformations are a little bit nicer, but uh, you could work with wild. For example, uh, Shrednicki's book is all written in wild notation. Uh, any other questions? I we have given a neutrino mass. Neutrinos are massless, correct. Well, okay. In this right pillar, we haven't given the mass, but are you going to discuss some of them? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're massless, except yeah. that we see them to have masses. So that is one of the issues about uh, why we think the story I'm telling is not the full story. Right. Neutrino masses is one of the keys, like our guide toward beyond standard model. But why is like, like so? I mean, if you just have the, is it like we haven't found the right kind of neutrinos and that's why we believe that? There are no right kind of neutrinos. Well, first we have not found it, yes. But there's a reason we haven't found it. The reason is that, well, you write down the charges, it would have. 
the right hand in the neutrino ends up, if it exists, it will be trivial, it will be colorless, it would not have high, uh, it would not have hypercharge or it will not have SU2 left charge. So it's only coupled to gravity. I can by hand couple to other stuff, but not through you know, like it's not coupled to gauge bosons. That's important. It will not be coupled to gauge bosons. So its mass, it, if it has a mass or whatever, right, it can come through spontaneous symmetry breaking. Those are all extra parameters. It becomes a little bit like standalone sector of the Saturn model. And we don't like those. Well, there are, this is all classical. Once you do quantum, once quantized, even standalone stuff can run in the loops. So things become important. Yeah. Just following up on what you're saying, I'm curious to know like, is there any correlation, like just hypothetical correlation between chemicals and this right handed? Not, not that I know of. This is fully, um, yeah, this is gauge theory. Plus, this is, well, I mean, whatever particle, whatever they are, they're going to interact gravitationally. But. All right. Any last questions? Sorry. Oh, well, we went real over time. Well, no last questions. No one's allowed to ask questions. Thank you so much, guys.